Good morning, y'all. Uh, so glad to be here today. Hope you feel the same way. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and find Acts chapter 20. Right, Acts chapter 20. This will be our 48th week in the book of Acts. So we're moving in the right direction. Acts chapter 20, find verse 1. Always good to start with verse 1. Y'all agree with that? This passage uh, that we're considering today really shows us how we can give and receive uh, Christ-exalting, Spirit-empowered encouragement. So if you need encouragement today, if you need encouragement every day, uh, you need to listen today. If you need to receive encouragement, listen today. If you need to know how to give encouragement, listen today, because we see it clearly here from God's Word. Now, if you scan down at that text, you might know that it's most famous uh, for Eutychus falling asleep during Paul's long sermon. By the way, that's something that a lot of you can identify with, that is falling asleep during a sermon. Uh, I'm only joking. And Eutychus' name, uh, oddly enough, means lucky or fortunate, but unfortunately, he was sitting too close to a window and when he nodded off, he took a three-story fall and he died. Now, wouldn't that be the talk of the church today if uh, those of you who normally nod off fell out of your seat? Right? Nobody would remember anything else about this sermon, but we would remember that you fell to the floor. And I pray that that doesn't happen today. Although I've seen you very close. I've seen some individuals nodding really close to the floor. So perhaps today might be the day that I call you out by name, right? I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Uh, that's not the end of the story. As you read the text out, uh, God restored Eutychus' life. But I want to say this story is not mainly about a man falling asleep during a long sermon. And it's not even a, a text about how you stay awake during a sermon. It's primarily a story about encouraging the saints. Now I say that because the first two verses open up with parakaline or this idea of encouragement and then there's an inclusion formed at verse 12 that uses the same word paracline it's translated in verse 12 though in most English Bibles as comforted so you have encouragement you have been comforted and then jammed in the middle we see that the churches in Macedonia and Achaia were encouraged and we also see that the church at Troas was encouraged or comforted and so that's where we're headed today so look with me if you don't mind at your Bibles at Acts chapter 20 uh, beginning with verse 1 and by the way I read from the English Standard Version after the uproar ceased uh, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them paracline there's the word he said farewell and departed for Macedonia when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement there it is again he came to Greece there he spent three months and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean and Phryas accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, or to have the Lord's Supper, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer man I'd love that right there <laughs> can't say enough about it dude fell asleep during Paul's preaching right anyway and being overcome by sleep he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead he died verse 10 but Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his in his arms said do not be alarmed for his life is in him and when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed and they took the youth away alive and were not a little paracaline comforted let's pray father yeah what an amazing uh, story here uh, it's my prayer that you'll give us the ability that you'll give me the ability to uh, say the words that need to be said to every folk in here 
Lord, I know that you have a way of saying different things to different people with the same words. And so it's my prayer that your Holy Spirit will intercept every single word that I utter so that by the time it reaches the hearts of individuals, it says what they need to hear. Father, we probably have some backslidden Christians in here. Uh, perhaps we have uh, some lost people in here. Maybe we have some folks kind of in between. Maybe we have some folks living in the margins of Christianity. It's my prayer today that you will talk to those individually, individuals individually and show them what it is they need to do in response to this massively important text. Father, please hide me behind your cross in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so verses 1 through 6 uh, have really everything to do with encouraging the churches, or as I said earlier, probably the saints in Macedonia and Achaia, or Greece. So after uh, this riot in Ephesus, Paul goes through with his travel plans to visit Jerusalem by way of Macedonia and Achaia. That's last week, but if you want to scan at that, it's chapter 19 and verse 21. And we're able also to fill in some of the blanks here because of Paul's letter, 2 Corinthians letter, that is, and Romans. And we know that uh, Paul was going to take an offering from the Gentile churches to the Jerusalem church. And here's what he says about, uh, here's what he says to the church at Rome about those churches in Macedonia and Achaia. They have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased. That's Romans 15, 26 and 27. And then he says, uh, perhaps one of my favorite small verses in all of the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that those churches in Macedonia and Achaia were cheerful givers. Okay, he didn't say they're tithers. Okay, sometimes we find it hard to make the connection between tithing and giving. We're called in the New Testament to give. If you want to start with a tithe, then so be it. But God expects us to give abundantly and cheerfully. And so Paul wasn't taking an offering to these churches that he had to just pull out of these congregants. It was a willful, obedient offering. And remember... He's taking it from Gentile churches to give it to Jewish Christians. And early on in the start of the church, the Jewish Christians didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles. And so the reality is the church should see today that that move signals for us love and support and unity and encouragement. And that's exactly the way we ought to act today. Y'all agree with that? Yeah, I knew you would. Uh, so this gift then was definitely an encouragement to the poor saints in Jerusalem, but it was also an encouragement for the Gentile churches to be able to give. I don't know if you've ever given or not, but when you give, it just feels good. At least it does to me. I mean, I pay bills all week. I mean, I hate to put it, I'll frame it like this, but I'm going to. And I don't like any of the bills that I have to pay, right? I hate paying my house note. Uh, I don't have a car note on my exploder, but the gas is about $700 a month. So I hate my, my exploder note, right? Right? I hate those notes. And I'm not saying that my offering is a note, but I love when I go to the ATM and take my money out of the bank and bring it here. It is an encouragement to me because the leadership of this church doing everything that we can to make sure that we use God's money the way in which he wants us to use it. And by the way, if you're uh, traditional and old school, let me just get this out. We don't believe God wants us to hoard our money. We believe God wants us to bless the community with what he gives us. Amen or no? Okay, yeah, we're, we're going to stay here again, like I said last week. That is what God expects us to do. God is not interested in us building our kingdom with buildings and other things. God is interested in us building His kingdom. And that's primarily what we're trying to do with the money that we take up here. We're not trying to get the preacher rich. We're not trying to get the ministry assistant rich. We're not trying to get Ken rich. We're trying to make sure that we do what it is that we need to do with God's money to bless this community and make the name of Jesus known. So God help us to be cheerful givers. Now, but I can't give a tithe. Well, give a dollar, right? Just be cheerful when you do it. Now, during Paul's ministry in Ephesus, Paul and the Corinthian church had a bit of a kerfuffle, if you like. That maybe uh, could be the word of the day, or a conflict. And Paul wrote a letter 
to the church regarding this situation. He sent it with Titus before he went to visit them so that he could straighten the situation out. And Paul waited until he had another conversation with Titus. By the way, that means they had to meet up because they couldn't text. And so when they finally met up again, Titus was able to say, hey, look, the offender has been disciplined. Boy, can you imagine if we reinstated church discipline today? Would I be the least popular man in Winston County? I'm going to tell you what, man. Being true to the text of Scripture is so important to me. Okay, You'll see it. You'll see it in just a moment, but just, just realize it's so important. So let's, let's not have to be disciplined, right? right? Let's do the things that God would have us to do. That's all I'm saying, but the reality is the offender is disciplined. They're, uh, they're good with Paul you want to read about that you can read basically all of second corinthians so when paul made it to macedonia that's verse one of our text he basically wrote second corinthians and he sent it ahead of his visit and then he finally made it to greece that is to corinth and he stayed there for three months the text says so paul encouraged the church at corinth in person not just by a letter does that make sense so we need to understand. We, not, not me. But we, not me. We need to understand the encouraging needs of people. And we need to understand that we encourage people by many more ways other than text message and phone call and email. We cannot miss what the text is saying. It is important for us to encourage the saints by visiting them a little uncomfortable and we don't have time to do it and we don't want to do it and all that the preacher gets paid to do that how do we do this well through small group have you been to small group lately right I'll just say it's very easy to encourage the saints in small group. you don't have to go visit anybody right you you can encourage in the small group now we don't give you time to encourage in here during this time of fellowship that's by design by the way I mean, we need to be worshiping God when we come in here. But I believe that in small group, we can encourage. How else? Well, we could visit folks in their homes. We could visit folks at the hospital. We could visit however, whatever our thing is. But it is so important to encourage the saints in person. And when we do that, the watching world takes note. And they realize that we're Jesus' disciples. So it is evangelism by default. I get that from John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I love that text. If we ever get finished with Acts, we might look at John. And preach in John and, until I die, probably, right? Because it's a very theologically rich text. But anyway, after this three-month stay in Corinth, Paul had to change his travel plans once again because these Jews wanted to get him. <laughs> and he decided to go back through Macedonia, which is where Philippi is. And Luke records for us these seven church delegates from the Gentile churches, these seven companions that went with Paul, that protected Paul, that served with Paul, that encouraged Paul. And I don't want to read those names for you again, but you're welcome to read through them. But what I want to do now is list three very important ways that we can apply this text, if you take notes. Three ways that we can encourage the saints today. Please get this. Number one, through giving. I hate to bring it up again, but I have to. It's pretty clear that this text is driving us to give. Paul took an offering from the Gentiles to the Jewish Christians. I cannot overstress that importance. By the way, after all that Christ has done for us, shouldn't we emulate the churches of Macedonia and Achaia and be cheerful givers? Yes. I ought not feel the same way about giving my money to this church as I do when I pay my power bill because I think they overcharge me. But God's not overcharging me. I know I've probably said this in here before, but my daddy always says, like many of you, you can't outgive God. 
And I don't know that I've ever found, uh, should I say a non-biblical principle? It's not a verse in the Bible. I don't know that I've ever seen a truer statement that's not in the Bible than that. Because God will absolutely bless you beyond means if you will take the step forward and start giving a dollar or two. Start giving a quarter or two. Where do I give? I believe you give to the church because we're doing what we can to help individuals. But I also this te- believe this text is driving us to give to individuals as God gives us an opportunity and as we're able. So if we have a lot of money left over or a little money left over and we have a neighbor that's in a bind, I think God's calling us to give a little bit of that money to somebody as he would give us an opportunity. Way number two to encourage the saints by visiting others. Man, Paul rearranged his whole life and schedule so that he could revisit the previously established churches. We ought to visit brothers and sisters in Christ more often. I've already listed a couple of ways that we can do that, but maybe we could have lunch with each other. Maybe we could have some coffee with each other. Maybe we could do whatever your thing is. I'm not sure what that is. But instead of sitting around and waiting on the leadership of the church to come visit you, why don't you go visit somebody? That sound a little ugly? Back in the day, I waited on the preacher to come see me. I remember my mom and daddy said, are we recording today? Okay, maybe mom won't watch this. I made that preacher go see everybody but me. Instead of having a mentality that uh, I feel like the preacher ought to come visit me, maybe we ought to have the mentality I ought to go visit my brother in Christ. A- amen? Of course I can get you to say amen when I force you to. Seminary professor said never do that, so I do it all the time. <laughs> the impact, I'm going to tell you, is amazing. Because everyone already has in their frame of reference, we pay the pastor to visit and so when somebody shows up that's not getting paid I'm gonna tell you it makes a bigger impact than when they see me in fact a lot of times when I leave you know what you know what they say he had to come visit me that was his job friends they know it's not your job through visiting others third way and I gotta hurry man we got a lot to say by serving with others in ministry obviously Paul was serving with these seven folks in ministry they drew encouragement from one another I don't know if you know this or not, but some of the best times you can have in ministry is when you come together and serve together. We've had some great times up here at VBS and uh, serving these basketball and football meals and softball meals. Uh, I probably said this before, but Lynn Coleman and I probably couldn't have a better time than when we drive the bus during vacation Bible school. As, as long as, as far as I know, nobody will ever have that job but me and Lynn. So you're not on that list. I can't help it. But we have a great time sharing the gospel through loving on these kids when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ together. You ought to try it. You ought to volunteer and just see that I'm telling you the truth. If you go into that service with a great uh, attitude and remember that Christ served you first, then I believe you'll have a fantastic time serving with brothers and sisters in Christ. So we see that the church was encouraged then in Macedonia and Greece. We also see that it was encouraged in Troas. And this is basically verses 7 through 12. And while in Troas, Paul and his companions worshipped with the church. I hope you saw that. And Luke's last phrase, they were not a little comforted, shows just how much this service encouraged the saints. And I believe that our worship services can be encouraging too when we follow the biblical pattern set forth in front of us. Uh, I don't think that worship services should be confusing and crazy, right? But I think when we look in the New Testament and kind of see the pattern that they set before us, if we go through with that pattern, we worship Jesus, we bring glory to Jesus, it's an encouraging place to come. Never a condemning place. It's always an encouraging place. Even if we talk about sin and the sin in our lives, it's not my job to condemn you. It's simply my job to bring the text out as clearly as I can and let you know that even in spite of all that sin in our lives, God still sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. It is an encouraging 
reality. They were gathered, so says Luke. By the way, Luke was in this worship service, so he's able to give us great detail. They were gathered on the first day of the week, the text says, to celebrate the Lord's Supper and to hear the word taught. All right? Don't miss that. And then uh, Luke sums up this section with verse 12, and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So here's the rest of the sermon. Okay? Three big applications from verses 7 through 12. Here's how this text intersects our lives. Application number one, we should gather weekly to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. Every single Sunday is set aside to celebrate the Lord's resurrection, not just once a year. It would be ridiculous to say Resurrection Sunday only happens once a year. It happens every single time we meet. They met for worship, the text says in verse 7, on the first day of the week. And that's because, Luke 24, 1, on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb and Jesus wasn't there. So they were worshiping the reality of Jesus being ripped out of the grave. And so every time we come together, that's what we're saying. Jesus is no longer dead. Jesus is no longer on the cross. Jesus is alive and well. And because of his death and resurrection, I too can have life. And so that's the reason we come together. Friends, you want to be encouraged? Then you come to the Lord's house on the first day of the week and celebrate with your brothers and sisters that Jesus ain't dead. He's alive. And he's still in the life-changing business. Okay? Big application number two. This will be met with a little bit of a, huh? But just hear me out. We should gather weekly. I'm coming straight from the text. We should gather weekly, more than likely. Don't put that in your notes. To celebrate the Lord's Supper. You can take a collective gasp. I'm not trying to turn you into Roman Catholic. I'm Protestant. Does the text not say in Acts 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together, see that? To break bread. Does anybody else see that or is that just in my text? Say yes if you see it. Now, the Lord's Supper was probably celebrated almost always in conjunction with a meal because we always see food when the Lord's Supper is brought up. And we know already that it was a centerpiece of worship from 47 weeks ago when we looked at Acts 2.42. That text says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So these aren't four separate things. These are four things that characterize what the early church did when they met together. So then on the first day of the week, they met and they worshiped, they broke bread. Y'all follow where where Luke is going? I'm just asking. Acts 2, 42. They gathered. They enjoyed fellowship. They prayed. And they celebrated the Lord's Supper. So they didn't gather once a month to hear preaching. They didn't gather once a quarter to hear preaching. I'm just going from the text. Another passage that I think uh, seems to really prove that the Lord's Supper was held quite frequently in the early church is 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, if you want to turn there. Maybe it'll jog your memory. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. And the fact that abuse of the Lord's Supper was such a problem in Corinth strongly suggests that the Lord's Supper was held quite frequently. Because I don't know that they could have abused it if it only happened quarterly. Right? That's all I'm saying. I, I don't know that there would have been any abuse. I mean, I just, I just really don't. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty 20 quickly. And when you come together, 
it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, most conservative scholars, most folks that you guys would read, really believe that that phrase, when you come together, is basically verbatim the phrase that we read from Acts 27, which says, when we were gathered together. And so they believe that that's technical talk for when the church gathers. So then, even though they were abusing the Lord's Supper, this text seems to, seems to be saying, when they met on the first day of the week, they were celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now, that's not the only thing they did. That is not what I'm saying. But it seems to have pride of place in the text that we're considering today. And we need to make sure that we just see that. And we apply that to our life. Now, uh, you probably are already saying we celebrate the Lord's Supper more than quarterly here. And I was feeling pretty good about that until I read Acts 27 and until I read C.H. Spurgeon's comment. And I believe that C.H. Spurgeon knows what he's talking about. Uh, if you don't, uh, maybe we need to have a conversation about that later. <laughs> but C.H. Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, commenting on this whole idea of the Lord's Supper, said this, and I quote, My witness is, and I think I speak the mind of many of God's people now present, that coming as some of us do, weekly to the Lord's table, we do not find the breaking of bread to have lost its significance, it is always fresh to us. Shame on the Christian church that, we, that she should put it off to once a month. <laughs> now, thank you, C.H. Spurgeon. And mar the first day of the week by depriving it of its glory in the meeting together for fellowship and breaking bread and showing forth the death of Christ till he comes. They who once know the sweetness of each Lord's day celebrating his supper will not be content, I am sure of it, to put it off to less frequent sessions. So am I saying we're about to have the Lord's Supper weekly? Well, maybe so. But you just need to know that it's my job to drive us to greater biblical fidelity in every single thing that we do. I'm not uh, casting any stones on myself or any other church that only uh, celebrates the Lord's Supper quarterly. I'm not doing that. But I'm just saying let's be careful to entertain what the text is saying. And make sure that our worship services, where they can, line up exactly the way they did with the early church. Because I believe that's the pattern that God wants us to follow. Now, what does the Lord's Supper even mean? Maybe if we knew what the Lord's Supper meant, it wouldn't be so objectionable. When somebody says, we should have the Lord's Supper every week. And so I want to thank, even though he's not here, Russell Moore and Wayne Grudem, uh, my seminary professor in systematic theology and another great theologian uh, for their teaching on the Lord's Supper here. And I'm about to say some things uh, that they taught me. And so there are several realities symbolized in the Lord's Supper that I want to make sure that you get if you take notes. Number one, Christ's death. So when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we literally symbolize the death of Christ because our actions give a picture of his death for us. The broken or small pieces of bread that we take represents the breaking of Christ's body. And the pouring out of the juice symbolizes the pouring out of Jesus' blood on the cross at Calvary for us. This is, by the way, the very reason that Paul says this is a participation and a proclamation. We're participating in the gospel message, even though we're not preaching it, and we're proclaiming the gospel message. I get that from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So do we just proclaim the Lord's death four times a year? Just a question to think about. Uh, number two, our participation in the benefits of Christ's death. Jesus commanded his disciples in Matthew 26, 26, take, eat, this is my body. So as we reach out to take the cup, and as we reach out to take the bread, we are literally proclaiming, I'm taking the benefits of what Christ did on the cross to myself. So I'm believing that his redemption was for me. It's a proclamation. Number three, I believe it serves as a spiritual nourishment. Uh, food nourishes our physical bodies unless, of course, you're eating on the keto diet. <laughs> That's a joke. You can laugh and wake up. 
So the Lord's Supper, that is the bread and the juice of the Lord's Supper, supper gives spiritual nourishment. Now I get that from one place. Uh, it's John 6, 53 through 57. Non-believers really have a good time with this one. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So will whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Maybe I won't ever preach through John, right? But Jesus isn't talking about cannibalism here, obviously. He's speaking of spiritual participation in the benefits of redemption that Jesus bought for us on the cross at Calvary. The spiritual nourishment of the Lord Jesus Christ is both symbolized and experienced in our participation in the Lord's Supper. Way number four, my favorite, the unity of the believers. Friends, when we participate in the Lord's Supper together, we give a clear sign of our unity in Christ, right? Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're saying even though we're many, we're really just one in Christ. Now, I don't how significant that was in the day with uh, a bunch of racism going on and a bunch of Gentiles this and Jews that but I want you to know when we come together as a church it doesn't make any difference what color we are it doesn't make any difference who we root, root for today in the NFL it doesn't make any difference how much money we make or how much money we don't make none of that matters when we come to this table Every single person, even in the eyes of God, because we're one in Christ. And if there's no other way that I can express that to you except offer the Lord's Supper. And so I think it is a very vital, a very vital part of what we do as a church. So I think when you put all these together uh, and you begin to see the rich meaning of the Lord's Supper, I don't think it's quite as much a, ah, oh, they do the Lord's Supper every Sunday. If you're interested in this, there are a lot of churches that do this. No churches in this community, probably. Uh, but so you'll know, I reached out to a couple of pastors, did some research, and I've told you before that Tony Merritt is one of my favorite preachers and commentators. Uh, he is now a seminary professor and church planner preacher in uh, North Carolina, and he planted the Imago Day Church, and he is a seminary professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so I read a statement that he made in his commentary. And he's been one of the only, quote, celebrity Christians that will ever respond back to me via email. So that's why I love him. I sent him an email saying, brother, I'm reading through this, yada, 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 I love it. You know, am I reading too much in this text? Or do you say that Omega Day has the Lord's Supper every Sunday? His response was, thanks, mate comma, we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday, period. I went out here by myself. I just want you to understand that uh, over the years, we've decreased our frequency of coming to the Lord's table. And I'm not sure if that's because of logistics. I'm not sure if it's because it's not easy to incorporate it into the text. I don't know. But I just want you to know that I believe when we really are clear on what the Lord's Supper means, we probably can't have it enough. So I've got to go quickly here. Three uh, big applications. Number one, we should gather weekly to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Number two, we probably, right, we should gather weekly to, nope, we should gather weekly to celebrate the Lord's resurrection for sure. Number two, we should gather weekly to celebrate the Lord's Supper, or at least it should be more frequent than it probably currently is. And number three, we should gather weekly to hear the Word of God taught. It's in the text. Don't miss that. It's not my job to tell you stories. It is my job to preach the gospel. And the elders will make sure that I lose my job 
if I don't teach the gospel. The text says Paul talked with them in verse 7. Talked is from a word that we've discussed a hundred times in here. It's dialegami, which is where we get our word dialogue. And it means that Paul would preach, issues would be raised in the congregation, they would ask Paul questions, and then he would give them the answers biblically. Okay? So Paul preached the gospel, and it was a sort of give and take when he was around these Christians. Then after the Lord's, excuse me, after the Lord restored Eutychus' life, the text says in verse 11 that Paul conversed with them a long while. The word for conversed is homileo, which is a derivative of homilia, which is synonymous for dialegami. Now, you don't care about all that, but it's very important because God chose to use the Greek language to reveal himself to us. So it's important to believe it. And the reality is, homilia is where we get our word homily, which means a short sermon. It's also where we get our word homiletics, which is the art of preaching. So when Paul conversed with these folks, he wasn't simply talking like we do. He was preaching the gospel. It's what God's saying. You ever been to a worship service where they never get around to preaching? Raise your hand if you have. I'm just curious. Just, just raise your hand. They never really preach. They tell good stories, but they never preach. God calls us to gather here weekly to hear the Word. So what do we make of this text? Well, for believers, uh, remember what Christ went through on the cross for you. <laughs> right? Remember that He sustained six long hours of pain on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Remember that we gather today to celebrate the resurrection, to celebrate the reality that because Christ was raised from the dead, we too can have life everlasting. It's an important reality to see. It's not a sad thing. It's not a bad, oh, it's 930, I've got to go to church. No, you are the church if you're a believer. You get your tail up and you come and gather with the church. Amen? That's the reality of what believers ought to be doing with this text. And then we ought to remember that one day, since Jesus is no longer dead, and he's been resurrected from the grave, and he's been ascended to the Father, he's going to break forth out of the sky, and he's coming down, and he's taking believers with him. So how in the world can't we gather together with like-minded believers and celebrate this every single time we can? Can't answer the question for you, but you can answer it for yourself. For unbelievers, please understand that the work of salvation has already been done. Christ achieved your salvation on the cross at Calvary. And the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So here's what we're about to do. Listen so it won't be confusing. For all believers, in just a moment after I pray, I'm going to ask you to come down take the elements, take them back to your seat and have the Lord's Supper after you examine yourself. Okay? We have elements here, we have elements in the back. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're welcome to come to the Lord's table with us. If you're a non-believer and you sense God drawing you to himself, okay, I need to get saved today and I don't know what that means, I don't know what that looks like. I'm going to be standing over here. But I'm going to tell you now, the only thing you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. But I'm going to be standing over here to help you through that process if you need me. Also, if you have some other decision you'd like to make, if you need prayer from me, if you need something else, friends, during this last song, I'm going to be standing over here for you. You come see me, okay? I'm going to ask you to stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Amen, believers are welcome elements anybody that needs to see me i'll be standing to my right your left father thank you for today uh you know how i set out this week not really wanting to preach this sermon because it says some different things uh, but at the same time father you know and you make sure that i know daily <laughs> that i'm nothing without this text <laughs> preach without your text and so, Lord, it's my prayer that every person in here will uh, believe, get on board, and agree with the fact that the Bible has the final authority in all things. And so, therefore, we trust your word. We trust it completely. 
And we believe that your word is life-giving and life-transforming. And Father, we know that sometimes we can be knocked off course as Christians. And we can get so busy that we don't even have time to open up what you've revealed to us. We don't even have time to see what you say to us. Days maybe without opening your word. Yet when we find a strong desire to fall in love or back in love with your word today, Father, because we see your son clearly. But we don't see that in visions. We don't see that going down the road on the highway. We don't see that in the woods, deer hunting or duck hunting or turkey hunting or any other kind of hunting. We see it through your word. God, I pray for a revival today in your church. I pray that people here will not be the same when they leave this gathering. I pray that folks will be able to say, we have gathered today with God's people and we have heard from Jesus. Father, I'm going to pray for my friends now that will come and take the elements and go back to their seat. I pray that they'll do as the text of Scripture says first. Examine, confess any unconfessed sin. I pray for unbelievers. Help them to see now there's not a single sin that Christ didn't die for. And there's not a single sin that Christ won't save us from. Father, I pray that you'd have your own way now during this time of communion and reflection, and maybe invitation in Christ's name. Amen.